Welcome into another episode of Beers with Mirrors. Today, we have punter Blake Gilligan of the New Orleans Saints. He actually went to Penn State with me. That's where we met. He's a great guy. He's extremely smart. Actually got into med school, which he talks about. But right now is a punter in the NFL and is most known for, at the moment, the tweet that he put out about having to change his number to number five because Derek Carr is coming into Louisiana and he is going to be number four. So it's been great catching up with Blake. You guys will love the conversation. He also had an infamous mullet in college and we do a mullet March Madness as well. So enjoy everything that is to come with Blake Gilligan. But now it's time to get into win or lose we booze. We're talking about March Madness, right? My final four was doing so well until Duke lost. So that's unfortunate. But I still have three of the four remaining, Alabama, Houston, and UCLA. So I'm very excited about that. We'll see how far that can go. But I'm not doing as bad as I thought I would this year. Obviously suffered some upsets like everyone else did but nonetheless win or lose we booze and three of the four still alive at this point despite all of the upsets that had happened I will take that at this point now I want to get into a special shout out to Nino Bonacorsi the 197 pounder of the Pitt Panthers wrestling team who won his first national title last weekend and it was the first national title for Pitt wrestling since Nino's coach Keith Gavin did it back in 2008 now Nino with an undefeated season and a championship title is up for the Hodge Trophy, which for those of you who don't know, the Hodge Trophy in wrestling is like the Heisman in football. So I'm very excited. You can now vote for Nino for Hodge Trophy winner as well. So definitely go out and do that. But all 10 finalists, um, all 10 champions, I should say, are actually nominated for this award this year, which is super cool. But Shout out to Nino of Pitt Wrestling. Congratulations on a national title. We will drink to that for sure. And now, it usually in this show series, I do a beer review of a beer that I'm drinking, but I'm going to let Blake Gilligan take the reins on this one, and he is going to give you all a wonderful beer review before we get into a riveting conversation that I hope you all enjoy on this episode of Beers with Mirrors. Presented by Picks and Parlays. Um, here on Beers with Mirrors, we rank things on taste and then chugability. So on a scale mm. of one to ten, what is the taste? And then scale of one to ten, oh, the chugability. Taste. I'm guessing we're at a ten. Yes. Got it. Um, this is like a this is like an eight three. I think this is this is one of your this is one of your better tasting beers um, on the market. But it's only it's probably only regionally available. So um i'm not sure if you're if your market your market's mostly northern yeah i don't know if I i'm can not sure if it's available but that's that's a shame because it's really good i know well i'll hit them up tell them blake sent me if i'm ever down i think it's available online so juice for ipa there you go so taste right, we'll good taste yep and chugability now, oh chugability the ipa chugability is as a whole not good yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe like a three yeah, it's a little 3. heavy. 3.1. 31. Yeah, it's, uh, they got some bite to them. That was our first official beer review by a guest. So, Blake, not good chug chugability, but the taste is there. All right, Blake Gilligan, welcome to Beers with Mirrors. Awesome. Good to be here. I'm so excited that you're here. So, we were just talking. This is the fifth episode officially of Beers with Mirrors. And we go way back, but number five is something we have to talk about today because your number, because Derek Carr, which exciting news is coming to your team in the New Orleans Very Saints, exciting. but now you don't have your number four anymore. You announced that um, on Twitter. Did you find out on Twitter that you were losing your number? Uh, not exactly. Um, it was kind of assumed the entire time it was gone, but Derek and I did communicate about it. <laughs> it wasn't exactly a choice. Um, it was a short conversation, but I'm glad to be in number five and I'm glad this is episode number five. So it works out well. Yeah. Cheers to that. Wait, what was the conversation? Derek, did Derek text you and basically be like, listen, I'm coming here and you no longer have your number. Like, this is how this works. Like, was there an asking for the number? So how it kind of worked, I'm good friends with AJ Cole, who's the Raiders punter. So he put us in a text thread together, kind of to in, kind of to break the ice, I guess. And so he kind of started off by apologizing for kind of getting me getting bombarded with all the number four edits on Twitter. <laughs> that 
um, was flooding my feed. Um, and basically was like, Hey, I'll take care of you. Um, so I think he hadn't taken care of me yet. So we're going to see what, what that entails. So Derek Carr owes you essentially. Essentially I'm just a really good locker room guy. So to accommodate the new quarterback, who's getting paid a lot more money than me, um, <laughs> I just was a good guy essentially. So Derek so. Carr has to take you on a date for this Ooh. number. I hope that's what it involves. I hope what would your what dream it. date be with Derek Carr if he has to take you out? <laughs> Derek Carr date. Maybe like a nice vacation. Like, <laughs> we're like, not like even fly me out on like, He owes you vacation. Like, a, yeah, like, a, like an Instagram DM meetup or something like that. Because <laughs> his contract is is not that small. It's not in small. comparison. So, and I can look up his contract. We can look it up together if you want. Um and we'll so see. I was thinking like one per one percent of a salary would be okay. Yeah, there we go. Alex is in the background, probably nodding her head at that arrangement as well. No, my, my girlfriend would, I think, would enjoy coming along too, <laughs> making a double date or something like that. I love it. We'll put this out there. We'll make it happen. Derek Carr owes you a vacation. Yeah, taking your number. <laughs> no, all in all serious. No, I mean it's so cool that you know the news breaking and all these big free agency moves happening and a guy like Derek Carr coming into your locker room. You were saying that you're a locker room guy. So I don't know if you've been able to talk to anybody a lot in the off season, but are, is, is everything high all the energy high with him coming in and positive moving into the season? Yeah, I think it's obviously an exciting new change um, going obviously from Drew Brees, who was a mainstay for 15 years, 16 years. Um, you're going to have growing pains after that. It's, it's inevitable. Um and, you know, it's been great getting to know Jameis and Andy Dalton the last couple of years and to still have Jameis with us this year um, to back up Derek. is going to be awesome. Talk about a locker room guy um, brings all the energy, the laughs, all that stuff you could ever ask for. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of excitement. And I think the team's really made some good moves to make us competitive this offseason. But it all comes down to how you perform in the fall. So how, how it is. You've been performing well, though, enough to get yourself another year there. And I mean, coming in as an undrafted free agent, you know, you're uncertain about how long you can play this game and where you're going to end up. But the Saints took a chance on you and you never looked back as I never expected you to, knowing the potential that you've had and how hard you really work. It's always been so impressive to watch you and how you approach the game. So when you found out you were going to get your chance in the NFL, um, I never really got to talk to you about that. So what was that experience yeah, for you? It was, it was an interesting year. 2020 was an interesting year for everybody. Yeah, and, we graduated um, at home, right? <laughs> we graduated at home. Um, we were at, I went up to Penn State, this is probably in March. This is kind of when the, all the lockdowns happened. And I was, I remember I was sitting in the weight room with Garrett Taylor. Um, obviously, you know him well, too. Mm -hmm. um, and we found out that our pro days got canceled. It was three days before the pro day got canceled. Um, all of our workouts got canceled. So it was really like very unique for everybody, the teams, the, the players. There, were, there wasn't really a lot of exposure to, you know, there were no workouts. Unless you went to the combine, you weren't really seen at all. And so that made it a little more difficult. Um, the Saints ended up being essentially the only team that offered me a contract after the draft. So it's kind of like a match made in heaven. Um, they had a, a fantastic punter who's still playing, Thomas Morstead, just signed with the Jets, super happy for him. Um, so I really, I, I got here, had a good training camp and I ended up staying, I was on injured reserve for the whole, my whole first season. Um, learned so much from him and kind of owe the start of my career to him. Um, I ended up taking over the next year um, through a camp competition. So it's all really about taking advantage of like a couple opportunities you're presented every year. And that's what I did. What does a punter camp competition look like? Like what are the yeah. things that you really feel like you have to focus in on? Because when camp competitions come around, everyone's looking at quarterbacks and you can see one guy outperforming another, but you really don't get to see a ton of that special team stuff. So tell me what a punter camp competition looked like for you. Well, there's two things. Number one, no one really cares <laughs> until it like kind of matters. Um, so obviously you're looking at the quarterback competition and you know who's going to be the starting wide receivers and stuff like that. But, you know, I only kick once every two or three days. So how that really works out is, you obviously have your distance numbers, you have your hang time numbers, you have the location that you kick the ball relative to the sideline. And that's really what you look at. Um, there's also an element of holding 
for the field goal kicker, who he's comfortable with. Um, are you screwing that up for him? Because obviously we have a veteran kicker, Will Lutz, great guy, awesome kicker. If I'm messing him up, he's going to go say something to the team about it. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's and, his job and, and, on the line too. Yeah, right? it's, it's it's his salary on the line when I'm holding the ball for him. Same to go. Same goes with our snapper. Um, so yeah, it's really just about taking advantage of that opportunity every couple of days. You have to show your stuff in front of the team because they really don't see anything you do on the side. Like guys do different drills and stuff like that during practice. You don't see any of that stuff we do. It's all those nine or ten punts you get during the team period. And truthfully, when you guys come out on the field, most people don't want to see you if you're no. you know, a fan of the team because you want your team to be scoring touchdowns, right? So we yeah, only see you I, I holding like the ball at an extra point. <laughs> um, I like to hold a lot more than I like to punt, I tell people. Interesting. And we punted a lot the last couple of years. Um, you know, growing pains after Drew Brees left. But mm -hmm. uh, I like to hold a lot. What goes, what goes into holding? Cause you also did that in college as well. So mm -hmm. a, how different is it from college to the NFL when you're holding? And then what type of skill do you have to learn for it? Because I'm sure every kicker prefers things just slightly different, right? Oh yeah. They're super picky. <laughs> um, Will's very laid back our kicker here. I know some kickers that need it like down to the, the quarter of an inch turn and they like it different for different plane services and stuff like that. A quick history of holding, usually the backup quarterback always held mm -hmm. because, you know, I think traditional coaches kind of wanted that fake threat of the quarterback being able to run a field goal fake, but no one runs those anymore. So it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't exactly give you much of an advantage other than the fact that the quarterback doesn't get to work with the kicker a lot because he's obviously doing the more important stuff of like, quarterbacking the team um running the scout team stuff like that so we just spent a lot of time with the kickers so naturally the punter is the holder um yeah and that's the case for every single team now i think yeah every single punter is the holder yeah. in the NFL now. and so it's really like i don't i work on it a lot but mm -hmm. in games i don't really think about it because i i feel like if you think about like oh i need to catch this ball oh i need to put it on the ground in the right spot then you you're gonna end up messing it up mm -hmm. I just do what you always done. It's not that was, hard. Was it different then from like college to the NFL to learn differently or sort of like the ball, was the ball different, the feel of it? The ball is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit bigger. And fun fact about balls in general is in college, everybody uses different brands. So like Adidas schools use Adidas, Nike schools use Nike. So it's kind of, especially for like punting, we used the hardest ball to kick in college. It's super skinny. The quarterbacks love them because the leathers like bunched it on the ends, but they're horrible for punting. So like, especially when you get evaluated for the NFL, people don't take any consideration. So once you get on that stage, we're using the exact same product that kind of levels the field. Um, and we have like a super particular way we break the balls in and stuff like that. Um, and I pay the equipment guys on the side to do it well. Get uh, out. Yeah, we pay them close to between the three of us, probably close to five grand a year. Wow. So learn everyone in college right now who's trying to be a GA or on a football, learn how to break in a ball for some extra cash <laughs> from and the kickers and got it. You got to motivate them. It's kind of like yeah. a supply and demand kind of thing. So, so do you do you then talk to them? At, like who approaches you? Like do, does the team staff somebody to break in a ball? Or do you sort of feel out who you think would be good at it? Take them through it? Like take me through this process that is breaking in a, the perfect ball. All right. Um, so when I got here, they had a guy who was pretty established that did it. Mm -hmm. So actually, I'll back up. You get the entire week to break in quarterback balls. So the kicking balls are completely different than the quarterback balls. You get three, you take three kicking balls per team at the start of every game or before, like three hours before. And there's a draft. So there's six balls out there. There's one equipment manager from one team and the other equipment manager from the other team. And they draft the balls. So like, I think the home team picks first. So there, there's some sort of, 
like is the leather connected well or is it there's some I don't, I don't even understand it but so they draft three balls each and we get an hour to break them in before the game so what they used to do they used to be able to do the kicking balls like the quarterback balls but they would like start put they put helium in them they would like put them in the dryer so they started like beat them to to hell yeah and so they put restrictions on it so we basically we have a guy who we pay to sit there for an hour sweating like just scrubbing the heck out of the balls um, pregame. And we we let them know if they're good or not. Yeah, I mean, if you're paying him extra on the side too, I'm sure. But okay, so then that goes to the added pressure though of what is your position? And I've been wanting to ask you about this. So not only are you the, the guy on the field that most people don't want to see out there, but you only get they limited amount of chances then to prove yourself. So what level of pressure then does that put on you as an athlete to be a punter in the NFL where every game, essentially, you're fighting for your job? Yeah, it's uh, – you kind of have to think of it in kind of a, a light way. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you really it, – it's weird because you warm up for 30 minutes before the game and you really get like almost one opportunity every 45 minutes to – to kind of show your stuff. No one cares if you had to get a warm up. No one cares if you're hitting the ball good into the net on the sideline. It only really matters what you do in the game. So it's it's something you tend you try not to think about. I think um, if you're kind of in a groove, you kind of just you ride it. Um, but you know it takes some mental toughness, I think. And well, I, I tell people yeah. all the time, you you couldn't pay me enough to be a field goal kicker. Absolutely not. Cause like I could hit a bad punt and it could roll for 20 yards and it's like, Oh, on ESPN, it's 55 yard punt. Um, but if you miss a field goal, everybody knows it. So you kicked though in high school as well, a little bit, right? I did kick in high school. So you don't confirm it's a little bit more relaxed. In high yeah. School. <laughs> usually those, more. usually you're not going for as many field goals, right? No, it's kicking in high school is uh, if you have a good one, it's a huge advantage over the other team, but most teams don't really care. So when that's you all won, I did in high school. When you won the state championship then in high school, because your team was like oh, good research. first state good championship research. in years. Thank you. You're welcome for that. Um, For like the first team in however many, it was first a long time since 1978. Yeah. So a long time, essentially. Did mm -hmm. you kick any field goals in that game or was it just more extra points and punts? Oh, no, we, uh, I hit from 53, 33, and 21. You remember. You remember the number. Yeah, I know my stat line because it was like the best stat line of all time. <laughs> um, I averaged like 61 and a half yards of a punt. Dang. So and you then, remember those numbers. Wait a second. What was your longest What was your longest punt in high school and your longest field goal? Longest punt in high school. God. I think it was 74. 74. Yeah, I think 74. And then longest field goal was in the playoffs my senior year is 56. Dang. Hit it off. So you know how you have the field goals and the, mm -hmm. the crossbar? And you have like the thing that holds the crossbar up? Yeah. It hit that. It went in? Yeah. No, well, so it technically went over the crossbar. It's called a stanchion. It hit the stanchion. Yeah. Dang. Uh, okay, well, it still counts, Which means right? it was, it was kind of, it was pretty much down the middle, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I love kicking field goals, but once when you get to college in the NFL, it's a different kind of uh, it's a little more cutthroat than high definitely school. a little more. Was, I, well, self admittedly, I was like forty eight percent in the regular season on field goals, so I wasn't that good. <laughs> but in the playoffs, I only missed from fifty seven, so that just take that with just take that as you will. You won. You were you were hitting them when it mattered, right? The moment, exactly. the moment was I mean, there. Who cares about the regular season? As long as you make it in the playoffs, just turn right. it on then. And then the state championships. So you're yeah, fine. Won it. Nobody no, remembers the rest. Was your brother your long snapper? So he was. How did Obviously, that go? Tyler went to Tyler went to Northwestern to play. Right. Long snapper only. Um, he was our starting tackle. He's our starting defensive end. Um, he hurt his wrist the second game of the year. Oh no! And didn't snap the rest of the year. So we had like a backup quarterback snapping. It was a disaster. I had like four punts blocked and we don't get, we don't, we don't need to talk about that. But <laughs> the most um, important part is the state championship. No, but won. the important part was the, the D, division one long snapper on our team didn't actually snap. 
He just did everything else. Yeah, that's insane. With the club and he on. still and he still went to Northwestern then to snap. So, but and then you went to Penn State to punt, and you guys are twins. So having to make that decision to go separate ways in different Big Ten schools, what was the what was the mindset behind that? Had you guys ever thought about going to the same place or did you not have the same offers? No, I had an offer from Northwestern also. Okay. Um, it was we I kind of decided it was the last thing I wanted to have happen. Um my pet peeve, I had two pet peeves growing up. Number one, he was always, he used to be six inches taller than me. <laughs> so, um, and I looked about three years younger. So everyone used to think he was my older brother. That really pissed me off. Um, the second one was, what was the second one? Oh, so like, say we're in the same class, right? Or like a church group. When they're reading the roster, like a roll, like roll call. They would say, instead of saying Blake Gillikin and Tyler Gillikin, they would say Blake and Tyler Gillikin. I hated being grouped in with him because I felt like my entire life as a twin. I love being a twin. It's like having a built-in best friend. But I felt like we were always grouped in together. And I felt like I kind of wanted to just, I don't know, plow my own road. It yeah, was, separate a bit. And I found the perfect opportunity at Penn State. It was great. And you did just fine at Penn State. Blake, do you know what my pet peeve was at Penn State? You were good at everything. And it was so obnoxious. No, I'm kidding. It was really awesome. But you were so smart. You were in the honors college for a while. And yeah, remember, the honors college thing didn't really work okay, out. Okay. But, but okay. you were you were in the honor college. Okay. Writing like 12. I got into the honors college. We're just going to say that. Yes. You got into the honors college. And I remember walking over from like dorm to dorm and you guys in Beaver Hall had the nice like little study area. So I'd always go over there and try to like print papers and use those laptops or computers, whatever they were. And I'd always go in and you'd always be in there. Always. It didn't matter like what time of night Blake would be there till like four in the morning writing papers. And I sat down to do an assignment. And I think my quiz took me like maybe 10 minutes. Like, let's be honest. My class was not hard. And then Blake's sitting beside me. And I was like, so like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm on like page six of a 15 page paper. I was like, oh, okay. And you were writing well, like see, here, one of problem. those a week. Here was the problem with what I, my academics in college. So I started off really good. And I was like, oh, this stuff's kind of easy. Like I was getting A's and stuff like that. And then like once I had kind of set that standard for myself, I like I felt like I couldn't let myself down. Mm -hmm. So I just like had to continue to work even harder. So like when I got to organic chemistry and stuff like that, that I had to take for my uh, medical school, or I guess requirements, um, I spent a lot of time on those classes. Yes. And, um, not as much time having fun, but I had plenty of fun. Did you? Yeah, I, I, we we had a good time. Did you sleep at all? <laughs> I don't remember you sleeping. Uh, I just feel like I used to take advantage of like the times where people would just kind of like between class and practice, like I would use that time to study or like directly after dinner. Like I wouldn't mess around. Like I would just, I would just get the stuff done so I could actually go to sleep. I wouldn't like hang out with friends and then be like, oh, I'm going to start my assignment at midnight because mm -hmm. I would have been dead um yeah with winter workouts at like four o'clock in the morning you ca you need to get in bed around 10 o'clock because then you're going to think about the winter workouts for an hour before you actually go to sleep <laughs> and you'll probably wake up during the night so it's just a disaster really um, yeah being and a college you, athlete's tough yeah and especially with what you wanted to major in so what did you end up majoring in did you go the whole like pre-med route did you finish that Ooh, another another good story um, so I came in on a recruiting visit and I wanted to be a biology major because I knew I wanted to be pre-med and I was told by an advisor that I couldn't do pre-med because I played football. And so that was a little off-putting. Um, Interesting. it was an older advisor. I think he was pretty traditional, probably had seen some stuff before. Um, <laughs> didn't think you were going to be smart, Blake. <laughs> yeah. So I kind I was like, well, what do I know? I'm a freshman. I'd I guess I'll just do kinesiology. Like it's kind of close. It's about, you know, body mechanics, movement, the study of movement. Um, and I loved it. It was awesome. But I, I ended up taking all of the biology and the chemistry and stuff like that for the, for the medical school requirements. So like I showed up in all these classes and like no one had seen me. Everyone's like best friends. They're all like biology and chemistry majors and stuff. And I'm like the, the nerd football player. Uh, everyone thinks it's going to fail the fail all the tests 
and just sitting there taking notes, not knowing anybody for a while. So that was fun. So did you end up majoring then in kines? Like or, so kinesiology? Yeah, the, I graduated. In you kinesiology. graduated with kinesiology. Do you yeah. have the requirements then to get into med school if that was still something you wanted to pursue one day? So I actually did get into med school. Oh, okay. <laughs> Back up. We haven't caught up in about four yeah, years. Yeah, we. Uh, so we well, need I'll to... need to take you through that one. Yes. Yes, you do. So, so coming out of college, I I wanted to play in the NFL. It was like my dream, but I didn't think it was possible, especially with the COVID stuff. Mm -hmm. So when COVID happened, I studied. I I started studying for the MCAT. I took the MCAT in June. I was just training and studying. That's all I did for like 12 hours a day. So I took the MCAT, I applied to six schools and I got into UNC medical school, um, Chapel Hill. Yeah. So congratulations. Uh, so the last couple of years I've been deferring my admission for a year. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's about come to a close. I don't yeah. How long do they wait for that? Anymore. My how MCAT is only good for so long. Okay. Um, so I think that ship has kind of sailed, but it's, it's kind of something fun to look back on and my brother is also in medical school. I was going to he, ask that. He didn't he take the really MCAT. He didn't have to take the MCAT. Like the most important requirement to get into medical school. Cause he was like a, it was one of those Northwestern programs where you, you apply after your third year and cause they want to keep their students in house. So the bonus was he didn't have to take the MCAT, which is so stupid. Like yeah. looking back <laughs> on it, because I had to take the MCAT. I studied for forever and I probably won't use it. And my brother didn't take it and he's very successful in medical school right now. So <laughs> what does he want to be? What specialty? Oh, he's gone back and forth so many times. Um, I think we're on internal medicine right now. Okay. I think that's where he's settled, but I always thought he was going to be an orthopedic. It just makes sense. Like football That's what you player. wanted to do, right? Yeah. And I think that's kind of like the common path, mm -hmm. but, um, there, there's some orthopedics with some egos out there. I think that kind of put them off. Um, <laughs> I'm watching, I'm watching Grey's Anatomy. Like I'm almost finished with the whole thing. And um, I love the stereotypes they give the different surgeons. And that's definitely what they give the orthopedics. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. And it's probably like the, the more widely accepted stereotypes. So that's why they put it in the show. So people identify with it. Um, so I don't think you really enjoyed that. I mean, we've, that's kind of all we shadowed when we were growing up and in college and stuff like that. So I think he was kind of done with it. Oh, so he never, never wanted to pursue being in the NFL. He just went straight to. Oh, I just, I wish he would have, he would have mm -hmm. been really good because like the NFL in, in college, you just snap and like immediately take off running down the mm -hmm. field in the NFL. You're responsible to block someone. Also um, the rules don't allow you to just spread down the field. Um, but he's like so athletic that he would have been really good at it. He's a good snapper. He was smart. He would have figured it out and he probably would have played for 15 years. So I still, I still bring it up to him. Like, well, why, why did you do this? He's like, dude, I just couldn't pass it up. They paid for like his first semester or year of medical school because he played his final year when he started medical school. Mm -hmm. So I think he might've been, I'm not sure if he's the only football player ever to do that, but he's got to be one of a very, very select group. That's not easy. Any student no. athlete to be in medical school. That's insane. Good for him. I think wow. it would help because it was all, most of it was online, remote. I'm not sure he could have done it, but he commuted from Chicago to practice because Evanston is 45 minutes north of Chicago. So he would commute on the train to go to practice. He would miss practices during the week. He'd just show up on Saturday like, hey, I'm ready to snap. Wow. That's <laughs> insane. I, I don't even know why I wanted to interview you today or talk to you on this show because you guys always make me feel so inferior as a human being. Oh, God. One's in the NFL, but got into med school. The other brother's in med school and got it basically paid for. It's fine. I'm just here <laughs> drinking beer and having a good time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Not much yeah, change. To that. But back in college, Blake wasn't just, you know, we didn't just have fun drinking beer uh, or Blake didn't spend all of his time studying. He was a very successful punter in school history. The only player in program history with seven punts of 65 or more yards. What in second now with most punting yards ever in program history as well. Something like that. Something well, like that. So the punting yard stat is kind of interesting because like either you were actually good and you punted like a medium amount or you weren't that good and you punted a lot. <laughs> um so it has a lot to do with how many times you punt um like I think I broke the the Saints 
all time record for punts inside mm-hmm. the 20 last year, but I also punted like a million times. So it's right. like, <laughs> my, my percentage was pretty good relative to the NFL, but it wasn't, it was like six or seventh in the NFL, but right. I broke the all time record just because of the volume. So some of those you need to take with a grain of salt. <laughs> well, the only player in program history though, was seven punts of 65 or more. You yeah. They were all in the air too, for sure. That's a good they're one. All, they're all in the air, all air yards. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> what was your experience like, though, punting at Penn State? Because you were very crucial to that program and the success that it had um, the few years that we were there. I mean, you had so many punts that were landing inside the 10, inside the five, like setting other teams up for poor yardage situations. So in, in bad field positions. So tell me what your experience was like there and how you grew as an athlete. Well, you asked about my experience. My experience was pretty cold. Um, yeah. <laughs> coming from Atlanta, I visited in the summer. And it was like 85 degrees. I was like, this place is the best. Like, <laughs> and then I got up there. I didn't have any snow boots or anything like that. And it was a disaster. Um, but my experience was cold, but it was also like just so unique and one of a kind. Um, playing at Penn State is just kind of an experience. You have to experience it. Kind of being, you you know what it's like being on the field and stuff like that during the game. That's almost surreal. Um, yeah. Especially, it, I mean, there's so many people there. It's like, it's like, there's nobody there. It's mm-hmm. all just, just white noise. That's kind of what I told people. Cause people would ask me like, Oh my God, it's a hundred thousand people. Like, how do you, how do you even do with that? It's like, well, there's so many people. It's like, there's only one person there and it's just white noise. Mm-hmm. I almost got more nervous in high school when like, I knew the people I could pick them out of the stands and in the NFL, uh, NFL college, like it's just a, this is a wall of people. Yeah, it is. that's a good way to say it. It's white noise Um, until you go to interview someone and then they start talking back to you and you can't hear a word that they're saying. Oh, yeah. Trying to like think of how to well, keep the conversation going. Yeah. And you have no idea because you don't know what they just said to you. <laughs> well, <laughs> that would be tough. I also got interviewed on the, the whatever the speaker or the, the loudspeaker in the stadium during a spring game one time. Mm-hmm. It's so hard because like it's a delay. The echo. So, like, oh, yeah. yeah, it's horrible. I don't know how you do it. That's insane. Yeah, not I just I felt like I was an idiot because I was like waiting for myself to stop speaking on a loudspeaker to continue. But like then there was a huge pause. So I looked like I just look stupid. Yeah. Know. You those are the times where you have to talk a lot faster and louder than you think. Yeah. And just like talk fast so you can hurry up and get all of your thoughts out before you hear it again. <laughs> but for yeah. any of you that thought my job was easy, especially on the sidelines when I had to talk to people, it wasn't. Okay? No, that's the that. <laughs> That takes a that takes a special talent. Well, thank you. Talented. No, it was it was <laughs> thank you. It was super fun. I had a great time, especially with all of you and getting the friendships that we had as well. But Blake, uh, paying attention to Penn State, you know, now that we're alumni, wrestling had a successful weekend at nationals. Oh. Apparently, we're a basketball school again. Um, but I got to actually have the privilege of going back and covering a lot of Penn State this year for the Big Ten Network. And are we a punting school? Forget Ooh, LBU. Might be you now. We might forget be. LBU. Be. Forget RBU. Are we punting you now? Well, yeah. So you have me, Jordan. Um, Barney Amore. Yeah, He's Barney's coming out this year. He could get an opportunity somewhere, which would be awesome. So that would really be like three and four years, which is kind of hard to think about. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but to be – to, I'm really good friends with Jordan. We just texted today. Um, but just being able to stay in touch with him. And we were like, what's one out of – I guess we're two out of 32. So one out of 16 is like, help me out. You're the reporter. You, you're I'm not. Major. First of all, you're way smarter than I am. <laughs> so uh, it's got to be like 6%, 7%, something like that. So it'd be like 7% of the entire people on the planet that do it from the same school. Good friends. It's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. yeah somebody, I mean, and we've got, so actually a punter from my high school is at Penn state right now. No way. Um, yeah, his name's Alex Paquetta. He was the number one ranked high school punter. He's from your high school? Years ago. Yeah. No way. You just, it's a connection. That's crazy. Wasn't so did you, did he reach out to you then when he was like making decisions? Yeah, I knew, I'd known him. I went, I went back and worked with, with the, the kicking and punting guys at my high school all the time. So we, we knew each other well. Um, they call my high school kicker you. Harrison Buck, who plays for the Chiefs, went to my high school. Get out. Yeah, the kicker at Duke played in my high school. The punter at Stanford played in my high school. So we're everywhere. It's just, uh, we just keep cranking them out. 
<laughs> we love that. And now look at Penn State. I mean, it was Barney and Moore was making such a difference on the field that he was one of my post game interviews. Like he was be he was performing that consistently. There you go. That exactly. Good. Like game in and game out. It was fantastic. And it reminded yeah, he had, me. A lot he had a phenomenal year. He broke, he, he pun it better than me. Yeah. <laughs> How'd that make you feel? No, it was, it was cool. I mean, it was really cool because when I, when you see somebody like you who makes such a statement and, and changes the program in terms of what a punter can do for a team, it's like, okay, who's going to be the next man up? And then Jordan filled that role. And then Barney comes in. It seems like they're always, they've always got a guy. And now they know they just have to go to your high school to find it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, I, I, when Jordan transferred in, um, I want to say it was my senior year because I helped recruit him. Like he, I took mm -hmm. him on the official visit. Of course, he's going to commit after I take him on the official visit. Right. <laughs> um, but I had known Jordan since we were in high school. Um, so we had a prior relationship. And um, yeah, in practice, like I kind of knew my job was pretty much safe. I'd punted for three years, my, my fourth and mm -hmm. final year. But there were some times in practice I was like, I don't think I'm going to punt this year because he's just going to take my job. Um, he just, he just has an unreal leg talent. He's just, he's just different. Um, so obviously was fortunate enough to play my senior year and not get my job taken, but um, <laughs> yeah, he's having so much success right now and obviously get drafted in the fourth round as a, as a punter. Not everyone can be an undrafted free agent like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes you get drafted in the fourth round, which is just su super impressive. Yeah, it was really exciting to see his name roll across the TV screen. And he's still in Baltimore, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you're, so uh, um, let's back up here for a second. Your girlfriend was cheering for him for the past few years because Alex yeah. is Baltimore Ravens yeah. cheerleader. So mm -hmm. <laughs> she was actually cheering for Jordan, not you. <laughs> yeah, I know. She didn't cheer for me a whole lot. Um, <laughs> she, yeah, so she, she cheered there for two years, cheered at Penn State. That's where we met. Um, so she was cheering for me for a while. And then, Actually, I left the year before she did, so that she was cheering for Jordan there. Yeah. And then she went to Baltimore. She was like, oh, they drafted Jordan's dad. I might as well go cheer for them. <laughs> um, so uh, it was uh, – she loved cheerleading. And yeah. obviously she just moved down here a couple months ago, um, so she hung him up. But maybe we'll, she'll, be a, she'll be part of the Saints crew at one point. Yeah, she right? We got to get her on the same page as you. What would you say? We got to get her on the same page as you, right? Back on. Back exactly. On. Exactly. You get, I mean, she moves to the city I'm in and she automatically doesn't want to cheer for me now. Got right. <laughs> That's her. when she decides yeah. to hang it up. Alex, come on. No, she's awesome. Yeah. She was God, one of our best cheerleaders for sure at Penn State and watching her career was so cool too. But um, what you were talking about, like moving in together, doing all the adult things. I feel like I haven't talked to you since we've been like children at Penn State. So like, what's it like being an adult now? Isn't being an adult weird? God, it stinks. Like, uh, she'll go to like Home Goods and buy all this stuff to hang on the wall, <laughs> and then I have to hang it. And it's like, what are we doing? Are you a um, handyman? No, definitely no. not. <laughs> um, I mean, like, I can't figure out what the walls are made of here. So, like, I bought ten different things to hang the stuff on. Like, I just try which whichever one until it, it sticks on the wall and doesn't fall off. Um, it's it's tough. I I paid someone to hang my TV. Like, I. If, if it if it cost me like a couple hundred dollars, like what? <laughs> Whatever. I just got resigned. Yeah, it's not going to fall off the wall now, I hope. <laughs> That's a valid point. Then like you're spending a, more for this. There's some shelves on the wall to my right that are just like, they're leaning. They're, it's just not good. Is there know. somebody on your team you would trust to call to like help you out? Or do you feel like everyone's just like, you know, we're just going to at this point bite the bullet and let somebody hang it up for us? On my team, maybe. Probably my long snapper. Yeah. Okay. Because he had a house like he does. He, I, I still live in an apartment. So mm -hmm. um, usually if like I need something done, I just call the guy downstairs to do it. Um, that's kind of like my hesitation not to buy a house because like that's super easy. It's super convenient. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then you're going to have to learn to do things. Yeah. So being an adult is fun. Um, I play a lot of golf, which is which is great. I learned how to play um, golf this summer. Nice. Fun fact. I you're am not very good. good. That's you got to start somewhere. But I learned I my I went to the driving range a couple of weeks ago and I was able to actually successfully like hit the ball consistently and that was a step in the right direction. The driving range where? Here in Pittsburgh. It's like thirty degrees there. Some days it's like fifty randomly, Blake. It's not always. That's what I was gonna say because like living here, I can play golf every day of the week. Like today was like fifty eight. I was like ah, it's a little too cold to golf. 
So I'm not going to go out. That's like when they open in Pennsylvania. It'll be You're 78 spoiled tomorrow. Spoiled being away from Penn State for too long. Are you a good golfer? Uh, depends on what day you catch me. Okay. Um, I just bought a new set of clubs. So obviously when you get new clubs, you're going to be way better. So I have to be like a scratch golfer now. Right. Correlation. There's no other choice. It's either tour pro or bust at this point. <laughs> yeah. But as a specialist, yeah. like you have, you, it's almost like you have an obligation to be a good golfer. Cause like you don't do anything else. Right. Just so, like... Pick. so like you have to be a good golfer or I feel like that's how my boyfriend feels now. Yeah. So a lot of time there. Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's good for business. Like if you ever work for a company, they, the boss is going to come at some point and be like, Hey, what's your handicap? we got, we got a foursome on a, uh, on Saturday. So what, what are you going to say? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Mr. CEO. I don't golf. Like yeah, it's good, good for business. <laughs> good for business. Have you ever been, um, is it ever your dream to go to the masters or have you ever been being where you're from? I've never been. I want to go so bad. And did I lived, grow I grew up, up, did you grow up like I grew up two hours from it? Yeah. Like loving the sport. Have you been to the course then? Have you been able to like go see where it's at? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Nope. I, uh, I actually never played golf till I got to Penn state. Wow. Cause the Penn state courses have some crazy summer rate. It's like two fifty for, you could walk the course the entire summer college rates and so we would go we would go for every single day after workouts and just walk the course play 36 holes and that's when I was really bad so yeah. I've gotten better I just need lessons which I just don't want to pay for right you'll just keep going get a new set of clubs that's the key now you'll be better maybe that's going to be the thing get a new set of clubs every time you want to increase exactly well this we're going to see how this one goes I should get them in this week um and I'd probably be way worse, which is just sad to think about. <laughs> well, I hope for your sake, it'll be better. If you drink beer, you're better at golf too. Uh, exactly. A bad day. It makes you I'm better at podcasts when I drink beer too. Right? I agree completely. But as a punter growing up as a kid, you also played soccer, right? Yeah, actually. Any other I sports? Started... Soccer, football? So interesting. It's kind of a fate thing. Um, I played soccer when I was a kid and I stopped. I stopped playing soccer. Both my parents were college swimmers. So that's where I think I got some of my athleticism from, but like not dry land athleticism. Um, so like, I'm not super fast, but I guess I have strong legs. Um, so where was I going with this? College swimmers. Sports you played? <laughs> oh, sports I played. Yeah. So I swam for a while, but that was super boring. And like you wait around and you swim one went. I mean, that's kind of what I do now. You wait around and you kick once, you wait around. Yeah. <laughs> but it pays good. Um <laughs> pays better than fun. swimming. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how good you are. Yeah, Michael Phelps, cool. maybe not. Um, so yeah, I swam for a while and then I hung that up. But I was like a huge baseball player. Baseball, basketball, football is what I played. Um, was never really good at like anything football wise, except for kicking. Hmm. Um, and then played baseball until eighth grade. And I, I either, I tore a muscle in my elbow or a tendon in my elbow and then popped my growth plate off playing. And I basically told my mom that I was going to go back and play soccer because I thought it would help me get to the NFL in <laughs> hunting, which it might have. It might have. So, <laughs> so yeah, I played, I played football, basketball, soccer in high school. Um, soccer, I was actually good at football. I was kind of good at, and then basketball, I was like. The, the guy at the end of the the tunnel with the cheerleaders that did the handshakes because yeah. I started the game. I started one game. It was senior night. Um, I probably scored like three points, but there you go. Yeah, I was a, I was a bench right? warmer. I was the energy guy, and I was just fun locker room guy. You know. Well, you were spending too much time obviously at home hunting and playing soccer, yeah. getting ready for your NFL career. Um, but you, I remember you telling me a story and I'm curious now, even though I don't think this happened because you just told me you're not a handyman. You used to say you used to punt the football inside all the time and ruin your mom's walls. And you said, oh well, yeah, finish them. Have you ever fixed your mom's walls? So number one, that did happen. Yeah. <laughs> I used to like, kind of like light, I would drop the ball and like kind of lightly punt it. It wasn't supposed to hit the ceiling, but like with an, with enough volume, like it just ended up hitting the ceiling like 500 times at least. And it was a white ceiling. Of course it was. Right. Um, but no, it's still, it's still like that in my parents' house. You didn't fix it yet? No, it's, but it's like nostalgic. It's like, so now she doesn't like want it. Memories yet. that you hold on to. 
So she doesn't want it fixed yet, or you told her it was nostalgic. Oh, I just think they just never got around to it. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> nostalgic for you, but they're just waiting. Yeah, my dad's like he builds all the like all the cabinetry in our house and stuff like that. So like if he really wanted to do it, he could get up there tomorrow. But so he's don't, he's sentimental. Don't, don't, about tell, it now. don't tell me, don't make me feel bad about it if you're just gonna it's like a core memory for you. Right. <laughs> But as a kid growing up playing multiple sports and in the house with your brother, who were some of the athletes then you looked up to if you didn't, you know, weren't much of a football guy, but then turned into a, you know, you're good at punting and then played soccer, basketball. Did you have like an idol? Was somebody like a punter you looked up to? Yeah, kind of, I guess. The 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 memories I remember are um baseball, the Atlanta Braves. I loved watching Andrew yes. Jones. Uh, Chipper Jones, Jeff Francoeur, guys like that. I loved watching baseball growing up. Um, punting, I would say Thomas Morstead's a big one, which is kind of like crazy full circle. Yeah. Um, but he was like so elite for so long. It was cool. Um, a little bit Pat McAfee. And then Johnny Hecker, who punched for the, the Panthers now. Mm -hmm. um, he had trained with the guy I trained with. It was kind of like his first client almost. So I got to meet Johnny last year and train with him. And that was pretty cool. And now I play him twice a year. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just looking up to those guys and then actually playing with them or competing against them is pretty cool. Yeah, that's definitely a cool moment for sure. A guy like Pat McAfee, who's made a crazy name for himself and changed and reshaped how the media is. I mean, he was breaking news with Aaron Rodgers the other day. It was absolutely insane. You know, <laughs> to have He's a guy got a who, good niche for himself. Right? To have yeah. a guy who was a punter to make himself into this and always talking about punters are people too, like your shirt says. How cool is the impact that Pat McAfee has now to constantly give light to guys like you when you do amazing on the field? Well, obviously he's built his platform to like, almost like God status, which is crazy. <laughs> like he's controlling like the breaking news of Aaron Rodgers, which is kind of crazy to me. Um, but he's just like, he's done it because of his personality. He has a great stage presence. He's funny. He's genuine. Um, and obviously you see him on like college game day now. So he's bringing like kind of the younger generation into that kind of stuff where not that, not that the guys on that show are super old, but like he's just kind of a fresh face. And I think that's really good for, for media nowadays. Oh my um, God. He's kind of shown like if you have a good personality and you work hard enough at it and have a good plan, like you can, you can accomplish it. Like he quit football just to do that because he had a belief in himself. And then he, I think he was with, with Barstool initially, I want to say. Is that right? I, I think he was with Barstool and then split off. Mm -hmm. Something like that. He was with somebody and then kind of split off for his Pat McAfee show thing. Um, so it's just, it's kind of goes to show if, if you love what you do and like he was making really good money punting a football and he obviously having a really good time doing it, but it, he saw a vision for himself and put it into action, which was just pretty cool. Yeah. He's insane. He's so fun to watch on his show, but also on college game day, he was a much needed element to that show. In my opinion, he does. And he's a punting advocate. So you have to love him. Huge punting advocate. <laughs> what do you think Pat McAfee would have said about your mullet back in college? Oh boy. Well, I know what other people said about my mullet and it wasn't super, mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I loved it. I'd, <laughs> I would do it again. Um, um, I think he would have loved it. I think some, you know, you got to show your personality somehow. And that was kind of my personality in college. Like I was an idiot, um, <laughs> but now like I'm a little more cleaned up and I'm a little more respectful, professional, but, you know, our kicker and our long snapper did a mullet last year during I the season. I remember seeing pictures of and it. And, like, I had just buzzed off my hair. Like, I, I had kind of like a fade, and it was short on top. And I was like, why would you why would you not tell me this six months ago so I could have grown my hair out? So now, like, they both have short hair, and I have long hair again. And it's like, I don't know. I, I thought it was kind of rude, given that, given that I, have, I, have the, I have the tape out there of me being able to execute the mullet. You did. You had a mean mullet. I won't give. Yeah, you could. You I could look it up. It. Uh, if you I'll want to look put, it up, I'll put on the internet, Blake Gillikin it mullet. It's. Uh, I'll edit in some photos so everyone can well, see. Well, there's some. Mullet. There's some good ones and some bad ones. <laughs> um, I'll put a, a variety. A variety. Yeah, that's it's good because it had like multiple forms, and I got to cut a great clips. No, no offense to great clips, but it wasn't like the greatest haircut of all time. 
Um, so I just kind of like let it go for a while and it got pretty, pretty dirty. Yeah. I would say you even, uh, were Joe dirt for Halloween. I remember the one year. You yes. That was a great though. costume. It was that very was great. Funny. Thank I you. Was, <laughs> that same year I was uncle Rico from Napoleon dynamite and you were Joe dirt. So it was great. I thought we looked awesome. Um, you know but fun fact about that? I do. I want to know all about the Joe dirt costume. Cause it was really I've never, good. I've never seen Joe dirt before I wore that costume. Did you see it after? Yeah, I'd seen it. I saw it after. But I did like people were like, dude, you look like Joe Dirt. I'm like, I don't know who that is. I don't think that's a compliment. <laughs> no, I was like, okay, like some guy with a bullet. And I looked it up and I was like, this is not a compliment. This is no, bad. That's not, but that's okay. It was good though. It was a great costume executed to perfection. So because you have, have such a history with mullets and you know what it takes to have a good one, I'm right. gonna ask you to rank some famous mullets out there between mm. people so we're gonna have like a mullet bracket so oh, the bracket. first march one madness. let's go yeah march madness all the things we're gonna Our have bracket's to screwed but that's okay we'll still do it You're right <laughs> bad Mine. purdue winning anyway all mullets right. billy what? ray or john travolta who did it better oh god i love john travolta too it's gotta be billy ray it's gotta be billy, billy, ray. Ray. billy ray yeah john travolta's john a good looking Tra dude john but... travolta is great i love him all right, Brad Pitt or Billy from Stranger Things? Do you ever watch Stranger Things? No. What do you mean? Auto win for Brad Pitt. All right, auto win for Brad Pitt. I don't know. You have to look that up, though, because that one's I don't, good. Yeah, I'm not a big, like, show-watching guy. Yarmir uh, Yager or Kenny Powers? I had to bring in a Pittsburgh guy, for, you know, Yarmir. Yager, because he's a hockey guy. Yeah. And Yagers yeah. that had like the volume, like the 80s volume right. of the mullet was really good. Yeah. All right. You or Joe Dirt? Me, for sure. <laughs> Definitely right, not Joe. So then if we're going through it, we have Yager, you, Brad Pitt, and Billy Ray. Oh, I'm gonna, I might have to match myself up with. So that's our final four. Damn. That's your final four. Who's your Who's your top two? Well, I'm I'm definitely out because Brad Pitt's in there. <laughs> um <laughs> uh we have yager pitt and billy ray me who's out billy ray's definitely in it probably billy ray and brad billy ray yeah. and brad i think billy ray's the winner though like, yeah he even made the just, song so yeah he exactly like he he's an advocate you can't you can't say anything else about it it's perfect yeah, it's gotta be a good one. It's a good one. I love that bracket. That's a good one. I bet we can find if you actually like Google like famous mullets, you'll see like 90 of them. It's insane. Yeah, like no, there were so it, many people that like have had the mullet, but I feel like you brought well, it, it, it made a comeback. People weren't doing it. it now everybody's comeback. doing it. Now everybody's I think doing I, it. I was like the, the pioneer. I kind of like <laughs> took the step. You might have been. And, uh, yeah, well, there's a lot of guys that now do it on the Penn State football team. Mm -hmm. and I feel like that was kind of me it was it had to have been it had to have been right I Maybe think not. so Maybe it I'm was better myself, but... I will say it was it might have been better than the Bieber hair when you first got to college well yeah but uh, <laughs> we had some we had some phases there were stages of growth in college always is I can um, look back and say the same thing about myself so <laughs> I want to say the problem is like I learned lessons from the mall the first time so I feel like if I did it again, it would be just like way better. Wait, give me your mullet 101. What are the lessons here to like grow a mullet, right. maintain the mullet, so, keep the mullet? The issue was like, I have kind of straighter hair and the transition from like the buzz on top to the long hair and back was very, it was very abrupt. There wasn't a whole lot of like, uh, it wasn't like a gradient. It was more like buzz cut to six inches of vertical hair. Yes. Um, <laughs> So like definitely would need to do a little bit more on top. I used to like spike the middle mm -hmm. up with, with gel. Um, probably wouldn't do that again. <laughs> I probably wouldn't go to great clips again. No offense. Hashtag, hashtag ad. Yeah. <laughs> hashtag not an ad for not great an ad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I just feel like, like I'd be, I would experiment with some product. Um, I get the ideal length. So I just think it would be a lot better, but I probably would get murdered if by my girlfriend. But. Yeah. But I think if you did the, I think if you did the, if you took the Yager volume at the top, it might not be as bad. Yeah. That's the, the only issue is with the helmet. Like when you yeah. put the helmet on and then take the helmet off, 
there's some pictures on on Google of that and it's rough. It's yeah, bad. I will confirm. It wasn't great, but you stuck with it no matter what anybody said. I will give that. I was not I was not wishy-washy about it. No. I accepted it. I accepted the challenge for the entire season and it is what it is. I love it. It was good. It was a good one. All right, Blake, my last question for you here. If this has been awesome. It's been great like catching up with you. 100%. All right. Songs is what we do here on Beers with Mirrors. I have a guest playlist I've accumulated from all my guests. They pick three songs that they prefer to drink to, and we we accumulate a playlist on Spotify. So God. three songs, if you could pick three songs that you could either like get the party started with, like or you hear and you automatically start drinking, like your three favorite songs to drink to, what would they be? Ooh. I'm gonna I'm gonna put an it's an honorary selection. It's not one of my okay. three selections. Um, but power hour on YouTube, because <laughs> that was just always, if you need an electric, just the start to a night, just start with a power hour on YouTube. Perfect. We used to do all it right. all the time. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, Thunderstruck number one. Absolutely. You got to play some thunder. Uh, got to play Thunderstruck. Let's see. Uh, an ode to college. Kill the lights. Yeah. <laughs> Take, you know, me straight, take me straight to G-Lax with straight that. Straight out of like. SAE. Kill the lights. Yeah. <laughs> God, number three. It's got to be... It's got to be some sort of country song. I don't know. I'm not a big, like, music listener. It's got to be some Morgan Whalen or something. Like, or Morgan Wallen or whatever you say. Yeah, Morgan Wallen. I can see that. Yeah, just, just pick me there. a song from his album and just play it. All right. Broadway Girls is a good drinking song from Morgan Wallen. That's a good one. There you go. That's a, that's good. That's a good third. Yeah. What was the song? It's like Broadway oh, Girls. That's, Broadway yes, Girls is a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. There I were like some. It. I could take, go back to like Country Night from Pickles and like hear a few too. That oh, would yeah. get me going. Big Country I Night shoot, now. I could just go down the, the, the playlist at SAE and just pick them out. <laughs> oh, SAE Thursdays. We don't need to go back there. RIP, RIP. R.I.P. to S.A.E. R.I.P. to Bar Blue also. R.I.P. to Bar to Blue. Best, best Blake's bar spots college. are all gone at Penn State. Apparently P-Man got an upgrade though. I heard. And I Champs heard. is like way cooler now. Champs killing it, yeah. I know. They're doing great. We'll have you to go back and visit at some yeah, point. Yeah, just not the den. Not the Actually, I love <laughs> Come on, I love Chris. <laughs> no, I love the den for a certain kind of night. Yeah. <laughs> it brings back a lot of nostalgia. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I love All it. Good. I love it, Blake. I am so thankful you came on here with me. It was great to just catch up with you. We haven't spoken in like four years, really. And so this is like our raw people. getting back to it. Appreciate you. <laughs> and now I feel like it's, uh, well, I feel like your beer is not very chuggable, but I was going to say, I feel like we have to do an honorary chug to end this. I've never done one with anybody. Well, I have, I have like half an IPA left and I'll, okay. I'll definitely uh, drink my stuff under the table with this. So yeah, let's do it. All right. Ready? Three, two. Yeah, let's do it. That was oh, good enough. Does your chuggability change? Oh, that's so smooth. Oh, so smooth. <laughs> Did your chuggability <laughs> score maybe change after that? Mm. Actually, it was for an IPA, very chuggable. All right, very so chuggable. what's the score? Ooh, I might it might have got Did it maybe bump? a one point bump. Like I got I got bumped up one one point on my number from four to five. All right. But so not the four one. It's a four one chuggability. Um, the taste is going to stay the same because it was it was excellent. Awesome. Blake, thank you so much for coming on Beers with Mirrors. It was awesome. Good luck with everything you're pursuing. You. Say hello to Alex for me. And I, will. I hope the uh, Jersey stuff simmers down and Derek Carr takes you on a nice vacation. I hope it figures itself out for sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, man.